So the session today is uh, on the semiconductor industry and the, the progress in migration of cloud to cloud of workloads for semiconductors, specifically electronic design automation. But I'm also going to touch on, uh, in the introduction, what we're seeing in smart manufacturing. There's a lot of exciting things happening there in the semiconductor sector. Vicky of ARM and, and YC of, of MediaTek will talk about their experiences moving electronic design automation workloads to cloud, the motivations for doing that, how cloud can help with rapid innovation and resolve IT constraints for semiconductor design. It's an exciting time actually in the semiconductor industry with advanced nodes, with the need for vastly more compute to make uh, tape out schedules, to get chips done on time. The ability to use cloud and scalable resources of cloud has really shown not only promise, but actually real results in helping uh, chips get out on time and with high quality. So let's talk first about the semiconductor industry as a whole, and then I'll turn it over to, to Vicky and, and YC. The semiconductor industry is, is complex, right? And we at Amazon, we're part of this industry. We consume a lot of chips, we use a lot of chips. We have silicon design teams at Amazon that develop uh, consumer products that you're familiar with, as well as data center products. We do a lot of silicon work ourselves, and we work with our partners, including MediaTek, including ARM, including others, to develop next generation services and products on behalf of our customers. So again, we have global teams doing silicon design every day. We have teams working on advanced infrastructure and consumer products, working with silicon devices we source externally. And throughout this ecosystem, and certainly in our own efforts, we're benefiting from the use of cloud in semiconductor design verification. We do multiple tape outs every year at Amazon. And in the past uh, 12 to 18 months, you've seen announcements, for example, our Graviton uh, ARM-based server chips the AWS Inferentia chips that are uh, deep learning inference chips, our AWS Nitro system, these are chips used in our networking and virtualization infrastructure, and there are other chips as well that, that we develop internally for AWS and also, as I said earlier, for other parts of the business, including the consumer products that we offer. And we really do believe, and we've experienced ourselves, that cloud is an enormous enabler for rapid creation and verification of silicon devices. Virtually unlimited infrastructure, the ability to get thousands of CPU cores when you need them to run large verifications, timing analysis, power analysis, design rule checks, right? RTL and analog verification. These are all very, very important workloads and they're scaling very high with current and next generation silicon devices. So it really does start with EDA, electronic design automation. We'll, we'll talk briefly about manufacturing, but there's no chips without EDA, right? Electronic design automation is at the core of innovation in silicon today. If we look at the full EDA flow, electronic design automation workflow to get a, a chip designed and verified and into manufacturing, there's many important steps to this. But if you think about where the pain is today, where the the largest amount of compute is required for advanced node silicon design, it's really in these back-end workloads. Workloads like timing analysis and power analysis, right? Uh, even back in the manufacturing side, OPC, computational lithography, opti optical uh, proximity correction. These are massive workloads that are growing every generation of new chips. So you need a lot of compute. You may only need that large amount of compute for a relatively short amount of time to get that chip verified and ready to go. And increasingly, cloud is, is really becoming the, the platform of choice to do those kinds of workloads, right? In particular, these large verification workloads, as we'll hear in a few moments. When you think about running electronic design automation or any other type of computer-aided engineering workload on cloud, it's important to think that it's, understand that it's not really so different from running traditional on-premise infrastructure. You have compute servers, you have job schedulers, you have license management tools, you probably need shared file systems. And all of these things can be created quite quickly in cloud, using CloudFormation templates, creating uh, such an infrastructure in the cloud, either temporarily or for long-term sustained use, depending on your use case. 
And there's ways, of course, to connect that to the on-premise EDA environment through Direct Connect and, and other methods. Also important to think about how cloud is different than traditional on-premise infrastructure. Of course, you can scale up and down and dramatically scale up and down. If you need thousands of cores, perhaps even a million cores at some point, you can think about that kind of scale in cloud. But you can also think about using cloud to connect your EDA infrastructure into machine learning, other, you know, into other cloud native services in order to get uh, you know, more optimal workflows, right? Or make intelligent decisions, for example, parameter sweeps in your simulations. Lots you can think about in cloud that are different from the on-premise environment. So EDA is moving to cloud, and we'll hear more about that in a few moments from MediaTek and from ARM. I want to talk briefly about what we're seeing in supply chain collaboration, though. Next generation and even current generation silicon design really requires much more collaboration across the supply chain and across these workflows than ever before. For example, getting information from the foundry environment, from the actual chip manufacturing back into the design process is a very important uh, part of this process today because it is a disaggregated supply chain. You typically have fabulous semiconductor companies, that are different from their IP providers, that are different from the actual manufacturers, and finding ways to collaborate across that ecosystem is very, very important. So cloud actually provides you the ability to do a tremendous amount of secure collaboration using secure chambers or using virtual private clouds, call them what you will. But these virtual private clouds could be a single tenant environment, for example, to allow you to burst out large amounts of uh, verification workloads to the cloud, or they could be collaboration chambers that you create temporarily to allow yourselves, if you're, let's say, a fabulous semiconductor company, to collaborate with a third-party design services company, or with your IP provider, or with your EDA vendor. This is real. Companies do this today. In fact, we at Amazon do this today when we work with our third-party partners to develop next-generation silicon. It's a very powerful way to think about cloud creating these virtual chambers using virtual private clouds, carefully monitored, access controlled, allowing you to collaborate almost seamlessly without having to create artificial boundaries in an existing data center or creating new infrastructure that you didn't have already for collaboration. It's a very important theme there. I wanted to briefly touch on the partners that we have in this space, and there are many more uh, not mentioned here. But partners are so, so important in advanced silicon design. And these include, of course, the EDA vendors that are providing either partial or full flow uh, design solutions. All of the vendors mentioned here are partners of AWS. We work with them to qualify the flows on cloud. IP providers such as ARM, of course, very, very important in this space. Uh, it's, it's rare today or perhaps even impossible today to do uh, you know, a complex system on chip without the involvement of third-party IP providers. It's a very, very important part of the ecosystem. Partners in the yield area, so Optimal Plus, for example, PDF Solutions. These are companies that provide that connectivity, that, if you will, that supply chain uh, data management from manufacturing back into design. And then design management, file management, partners in this space as well, increasingly migrating their offerings to cloud and many more to come, of course. So semiconductor innovation really is, is assisted, it is accelerated through the use of cloud services. And we'll see examples of that in just a few moments from ARM and from MediaTek. We're seeing it in small startups. Astera Labs is an excellent example that entirely develop their new chips on cloud. We're seeing it in larger organizations that burst out portions of their workloads to cloud using the methods I described before, to create that secure chamber, connect that to on-premise infrastructure, and accelerate their verification of next generation chips. And it's secure. Cloud is a secure place to do silicon design. Very, very important. So I want to turn this over now to Vicki Mitchell, the VP of uh, Engineering at ARM Limited, to talk about their journey to cloud and what they're seeing as they migrate to cloud. Vicki. Thank you, Dave. Yes? All right, good, good. Well, um, 
for those of you who don't know, I'd like to start off with a little bit, a little bit of a nothing, a little bit of a blank screen. Well, that's interesting. Did I hit the wrong button? Ah, there we go. Um, who is ARM? In case you don't know, um, we provide intellectual property, or IP, uh, that is used by many of the leading semiconductor companies to create their products. Our IP is so prevalent that over 70% of the world's population uses technology that contains ARM, ARM IP. ARM has a long history with IP design and IP development and electronic design. We began almost 30 years ago um, as a joint venture between Acorn Computers, what we were known at the time, uh, Apple, and VLSI Technology. In the early 1990s, it was the first time that RIP was designed into mobile devices, and then ultimately we jumped onto the, uh, smart, onto the smartphone revolution, and, uh, and we've been uh, working in that environment ever since. Today, ARM's IP is incorporated into a huge variety of technologies, from devices and sensors to networking communication, all the way up to the equipment that's in the data center today. <clears throat> ARM's business model of licensing IP uh, into the, to our semiconductor partners allows us to build a product uh, portfolio and a strong and global ecosystem um, around our ARM architecture. We have over 500 licensees, and to date these 500 licensees have shipped over 15 billion, 150 billion, excuse me, uh, semiconductor devices. Just 18 billion of those, 22 billion of those in 2018 alone. I knew I was gonna mess up those numbers. <laughs> so ARM has a long history with IP development and electronic design. Our, oh, I'm, I'm got my notes here. So how do we create this IP? We have a de de design process that is both flexible and quality focused. Our resource demands both human and computer, whether we're talking about cores, whether we're talking about memory or uh, storage, they're high for each phase, but by far uh, the highest in the areas of test and physical validation. As David mentioned, there's high demands there. And it's our engineering platform that provides the technology that supports these resources. There we go. We like to think of our engineering platform as the engine room, the engine room of our design. This engine cranks out over 11 million jobs per day. Jobs like compilation, regression test runs, uh, characterization, data analytics, and so forth. The jobs, are so, the jobs may be solely software-based, or they may require specialty equipment um, for fast prototyping and emulation of these integrated circuits. In the past, our engineering platform was hosted uh, on-prem in five ARM-owned and operated data centers uh, globally, located across the globe. But today, that's changing. To make sure we aligned our expectations f uh, for change, we interviewed our, our engineers about their use of the engineering platform. And we found that there were a number of driving factors. These, uh, as are listed here. <coughs> Excuse me. We wanted to recognize that electronic design engineering workloads are different than, uh, may, may differ from uh, typical enterprise IT workloads. We wanted to ensure that our, our users could focus on, the, on their strengths, which are engineering and design, and not necessarily running uh, servers and IT systems. We wanted to make sure that the IT was scalable and portable. This provides agility when and where the job is done. We wanted to cater to both the needs of the software designers and the hardware designers by ensuring that, there's, uh, that the product technology is dependent on the software that is used to create it as well as the software that runs on it. We want to incorporate operational intelligence into the resource utilization so we have smarter cycles. And we want to be smart about when and where those uh, cycles, the data that those cycles generate, when and where that data is stored. Ultimately, we wanted to incorporate the economies of scale that we could benefit from having a more agile uh, uh, engineering platform 
and make sure that we can do that with safety and security in mind. There we go. So we've incorporated these drivers into a transformation program, which is comprised of three components or tenants. They are change the engineering platform, change the way the platform is used, and change the way that we deliver the platform. In the rest of my talk today, I'm going to talk about how we change the engineering platform to make it optimized yet scalable, responsive, flexible, intelligent, and lastly, cloud-based. I found we need to be careful when we talk to our engineering users and, and stakeholders about changing the platform or taking the platform to the cloud. They've, they've been working on our engineering platform in its current incarnation for many years, in some cases decades since the very beginning. They may have highly customized workloads that may be constrained to particular geographies or particular environments. Furthermore, the program managers may be somewhat loath to experiment with new uh, platform runtime during the middle of the design process, the design life cycle, which can sometimes take, take up to three years. And, but continuing on in the present trajectory is not going to work. Um, we can't just continue to add more server slots, more storage, more equipment. This is not practical. For one, the technology costs a lot. For another, it takes, sometimes it could take up to six months to procure that technology and install it on-prem. And at some point, ultimately, up, continuing to uplift resources, we're going to run out of space. We're going to run out of space in our data center. We're going to run out of space in our computing environment. And we just, it's, it's not going to be practical for us. So we, we basically have to sell this, this platform, this new platform, this new environment to our stakeholders, to our engineers, so that they can recognize these advantages of being cloud-based. And the sale technique that we use is uh, attract them to an on-demand platform that scales up and down at their, as their needs change. It enables us to use um, our arm-on-arm -arm technology, our arm-on-arm -arm strategy, so that we can benefit from some of the, uh, some of the performance behaviors that come from ARM-based servers. We, um, we support this hybrid platform with a common front end and intelligent scheduler. And this ultimately gives the engineers the flexibility that they need for their runtime environment. But something lies between us and this ultimate optimum environment. And that is the specialized equipment that, we, that serves the need of our verification workflows. Each product generation becomes more and more complex, requiring more and more tests and time to ensure the quality is maintained. To meet the balance of this needs of increasing complexity and, uh, and balance that with increasing quality, ARM shifts ver verification as far left into the process as possible. And we do that with installing emulators, and FPGA so that we can run hardware acceleration. These resources are capable of running billions more test cycles um, than software, typical software-based simulators are. And they're co-located in, um, in our engineering environment for connectivity and transport, data transport reasons. But we like to call this our hardware problem. And a hybrid platform solves our hardware problem. Um, the hybrid platform, not all jobs are well suited to run into the cloud. Specifically, some verification test that run, uses the hardware acceleration will need to run on-prem for the foreseeable future. And some of our software-only flows perform better when they can scale. Some of them um, might be limited in scalability due to either memory or license constraints, tool dependencies, and similar. So if we put all jobs in a common submission interface and we incorporate an intelligent scheduler in there, it basically, it shouldn't matter to the engineer where the job runs. They submit their job as normal and the decisions behind the hybrid platform take into consideration what those constraints are. They get the results like they've always had and possibly faster um, and at a lower cost and burden, overall cost burden to the project. That's why we refer to this aspect of the transformation as bringing the cloud to ARM. 
We want to enable engineers to use cloud-based technology in a time and cost-sensitive manner without changing the way that the design process works. And there's several methods that we could deploy this method. Uh, we could deploy our hybrid platform. And you may be aware of some of these. There is lift and shift, right, where we basically reinstall our entire workflow in a cloud-based environment. Um, but that actually won't bring the cloud to ARM because it could be a higher cost to operate. And it doesn't support uh, enabling us to make cost-effective decisions by, by running jobs either on-prem or in the cloud. There's a cloud-first methodology, which involves porting our workflows to a cloud-hosted environment. And that may actually get us there fairly quickly if we go straight to cloud-first. But it doubles the maintenance workload because we actually have to maintain two different versions of the workflow, the on-prem version and the cloud version. And so therefore, our services team is, is, is overburdened by that. And there's a cloud native technology, which customizes the workflow completely for cloud operation and that you know, intelligent scheduling. But the problem we have with that is that we may want, not want to do cloud native for every single workflow. So how do we figure this out? How do we balance all of that? We call our approach cloud smart. That's how we're bringing the cloud to ARM. We're cloud smart. We instrument our workflows to tag the jobs with attributes such as a unique, unique identifier, execution parameters, dependencies, and things like that. And we analyze the data that comes from when we run these jobs in this current on-prem environment so that we can determine if a job can and should run in the cloud, what its ideal resource requirements are, and when and where the design life cycle a job can be safely moved. This analysis allows us to not only predict and adjust for peak demands, such as what we might see here in random courses during the design life cycle, it also allows us to uh, make, take ad ex advantage of things like extensive batch submission jobs early in the design process, and we can use that to predict. This analysis also enables certain functions, such as simulation or even product work groups, to make a move between on-prem and cloud at their own pace. So we don't necessarily designate that everybody has to move or that every project has to move or that even every function has to move. Our data gathering to date has helped our platform operation team understand how many of today's jobs can run in the cloud without any modifications, which is an important piece to know. It's also understand us, helped us understand how much work may be required to port the workflow that needs to be ported into the cloud using standardized libraries for managing infrastructure and a common API, such as our Cloud Runner. Thus far, we have determined that almost 45% of our jobs that run today on-prem could be moved into the cloud. These are cloud ready today. And enabling cloud execution for these jobs will free up uh, on-prem resources for peak demands such as emulation and FPGA so that we don't have to spend the money and the time to install that. Given the performance that we've already seen for production flows, such as our uh, logic characterization flow, we expect that up to an 8x improvement in turnaround time by taking advantage of the scalability that running jobs in the cloud can provide. So it sounds too good to be true, but it is true, and the data has pro proven this. This is real. This is backed by data from our Cloud Smart methodology of instrumenting the workflows and analyzing the performance of the system. And what we've seen, and we know how to, but we've seen some challenges, and we know how to overcome them. Some of them are listed here. The first one is, Talk about bringing the cloud to your EDA workflows rather than moving your workflows to the cloud. Um, uh, use a singular API for maintainability and portability so that you don't over overburden your services team. Address concepts like aging tools, dependencies like that through infrastructure patterns, common infrastructure patterns, including things like containerization that Dave talked about. And then finally, build in cost consciousness and by, and by also selling the benefits of flexibility and improved time to market. So in summary, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Um, we have talked a little bit about who ARM is, in case you didn't already know. We've also talked about the need for a digital transformation, about bringing the cloud to ARM. We, we talked about some of the challenges that we have with that around the hard, our hardware problem, 
and our shift left and verification. Um, and then last but not least, we talked about some techniques for how you can enable you to change server hosts, but also change the mindsets of the people that are using the platform. So I do appreciate your time and attention. I'm going to turn it over next to um, uh, YC. Uh, YC is the general, uh, general manager for IT for MediaTek. Uh, MediaTek is one of our ARM's key partners. They've been very uh, innovative and on the leading edge of technology, including their, uh, their more recent 5G SOC design announced at Computex earlier this year. We're very happy to have uh, YC here, and I'm excited to hear what he has to say about his uh, ED, optimizing his EDA workflows. There you go. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is YC Lee from MediaTek. It is a true honor that I can be here to talk about a successful story between AWS and MediaTek. My topic is realizing EDA workload running on AWS. In the following 20 minutes, I will first make an introduction on MediaTek and talk about some of the IT challenges of computing farm management imposed by advanced technology advancement and business dynamics. Then I will walk through how we overcame these challenges and what is the key consideration for solution implementation. Lastly, I will summarize the lesson we learned on the cloud journey. Let me start first with my company introduction. MediaTek is a global fabulous semiconductor company that enables 1.5 billion connected devices a year. We are a market leader in developing innovative SOC system on chip for mobile devices, home entertainment, connectivity, and the IoT devices. Our dedication to innovation has positioned us as a driving market force in several key technology. Sorry, in several key technologies including high-power efficient mobile technology and advanced multimedia solution. We lead the market in chipset technology for smart TV, optical and Blu-ray DVD players, voice assistant devices, feature phones, Android tablets, and the connectivity network. We are number two globally in smartphones. Particularly, our 5G SOC development is where our EDA cloud journey starts to address the 7 nanometer technology adoption and the IC design complexity. The 5G SOC packs the latest CPU, GPU, and the AI technologies, making the chipset the most powerful SOC announced to date. It was built on cutting edge seven nanometer process and features the latest ARM, CPU, GPU, and all new MediaTek AI process unit. Besides, the speed is throughput is 4.7 gigabit per second, sorry. As you can see, more and more powerful IC will build on advanced nodes. What does it mean? and what is the implication to computing farm management? And the most important thing, can we do it better? Before I share my company case, let's look at the silicon development trends and its challenge on IT management. If we compare the design complexity, EDA workload required, and the computer scale 
of a seven nanometer node and uh, uh, with a 14 nano, nanometer node, our internal inter information indicates a two digit increase from the transistor density require EDA job number and a server per project. The increase, the point of view, the increase number is 17 times, 10 times, and 15 times respectively. So combined with these three factors, how we respond to computing farm management remains a challenge. What's more, our R&D plan change and the business uncertainty always lead a huge resource gap in high utilization computing farm. After looking at this reality chart, I think we all familiar with it. You are not alone. Can we resolve this problem in a smart way? Okay, in the following, I will provide our case to try to pro provide some answer for that. In recent years, the hybrid cloud solution has been evolving, spread is fast, and adopted by more and more enterprises to scale the resources to address demanding IT challenges. MediaTek also jumped on the bandwagon. Our scenario starts with a large requirement that we have to provide more than 1,000 servers with a high memory configuration within one week. As you can see, this is a really challenge. But with the Asia resource provision through hybrid cloud, the result is exhilarating, and the result turned out to be a big success for our 5G SOC project. I'm glad to hear to take this opp opportunity to share our case along the way, our cloud journey. I hope this sharing will inspire more and more enterprise to adopt the cloud on the EDA. So let's move on to the result we have achieved for the EDA running on AWS. As mentioned before, with the scalability and the flexibility of hybrid cloud infrastructure, media tech IT was able to deploy powerful cloud instance on a large scale within a very, very streamed schedule. Thanks to this, our 5G SOC project was fulfilled on time. On top of that, I want to share with you some remarkable achievements that Media, media tech IT has achieved. First of all, the most phenomenal achievement is that media tech is arguably the first one in this industry to achieve EDA running job on the cloud to boost seven nanometer SOC project and to integrate, integrate STA sign up process flow simultaneously. From our business point of view, it really makes a big difference. Secondary, larger amount of computing resources is fundamental to our 5G SOC project. As a result, in this case, media tech can use over 20, 12 million core hours with high memory cloud instance on a large scale to address, to address computing challenge and close the resource gap. As you can see, that's a tremendous challenge toward traditional IT infrastructure. By contrast, we media tech IT can cope with this problem bursting workload in, during the pick, pick, pick out with these hybrid cloud solutions. Sorry. Thirdly, you may notice that the general STA process tool usually take up 
huge computing resources, as well as accumulate large number of data after calculation. In this project, MediaTek was able to manage active R&D data more than 8,000 terabytes and carry out the data transport over the internet between our on-premise environment and the AWS system. Here, I'd like to emphasize two key things to support these achievements. The first is a seamless collaboration between MediaTek and the AWS. We work as a robust team and even build a project warren operated by 24 by 7 when there is an emergency. By this way, we were able to accommodate various cloud bursting on a demand basis. Secondary, I want to highly recognize the AWS professional team during this collaboration as they, can have, they have been very capable of easy to con instance customization geared toward our specific workload patterns and the demanding I.O. intensity within very tight schedule. We are very impressed that AWS has demoed such a high quality of support and infrastructure agility. Next, I will elaborate on the key consideration associated with this design of hybrid cloud infrastructure and our EDA design flow integration. When media tech IT uh, look at the hybrid cloud architecture adoption, we identify four key success factors and they are user experience, data transfer, resource efficiency, and data security. First of and foremost, coherent user experience. Maintaining a consistent user experience for our engineer is crucial to our R&D productivity. To this end, we, IT aims to develop this backend hybrid cloud infrastructure transparent to our R&D users. This means that the user wouldn't, wouldn't have to change the way they have been working, particularly in the stage of job submission or job status monitoring. Second, effective and efficient data transport. From IT perspective, the consideration was how to manage the necessity of large scale data transfer between MediaTek headquartered in Taiwan and the Amazon data center on the west coast of US with around 200 millisecond network latency across the internet. Third, cloud resource management and optimization. It's all about IT OPEX. And the following three justifications was were engaged in the effort, in the effort to maximize cloud resource usage. Number one, how to set priority for this is selected early job and dispatch them to run on cloud instance. Number two, in conjunction this appropriate configuration, we need to identify the CPU cores, memory allocation, disk I.O. capacity to for the resource allocation. Number three, how to automate life cycle management of cloud machines. That is, these cloud resources can be turned on and turned off on a demand basis without manual intervention. Last but not least, cloud data security and protection. We have to consider how to further increase the security level on top of public cloud infrastructure so that 
on the team is confident in putting their EDA jobs on this hybrid cloud. It's our IT responsibility to come up with a tangible process to mitigate data leakage risk. Let me go through the details how we make it in the next slide. In terms of user experience, a unified user experience, the solution is to have a fundamental integration with R&D data flow to serve this need. When IT enables cloud bursting capability, the customized flow process began to migrate EDA jobs from on-premise environment to the cloud automatically. This backend transition is entirely transparent to users. This implies that R&D can run business as usual without being impacted by this infrastructure change. In terms of data transport, we tailor the data wrapper to the client design flow, which means we reshape the data sources by selecting the required data files and by eliminating redundant data structure to some extent, then we repack these data sets for further transport. Meanwhile, we also deploy a high, highly efficient file transfer solution to boost the data sync performance between on-premise and the cloud environment. In terms of resource efficiency, we choose only key EDA flows to run on the cloud. Based on workload patterns, we work out the, the appropriate types of cloud instance for, most, for the most part. We also team up with AWS archi architect team to tailor special cloud instance to fulfill exceptional workload patterns. For example, the extremely IO intensive Moreover, we leverage our batching system to orchestrate predefined job overflow to cloud on demand. As a result, we were able to scale up and down cloud resources as needed without manual intervention. In terms of data security, we meticulously encapsulate the, de the design files essential to this simulation. So the underlying risk of design data leakage could be reduced significantly. Moreover, all of R&D data and the reports residing in the cloud will be completely wiped out after they were sent back to on-premises storage. Here, I walk through the solution introduction. I would like to highlight three key technology building blocks and two critical phase factors that account for all the above mentioned breakthrough. These three pivot technology building blocks are Number one, critical design flow customization. Number two, cloud infrastructure design and orchestration. Number three, smart batching system integration. In addition to key technology building blocks, I have to reinforce two key factors that are indispensable to the overall success. The first one is build close partnership with your R&D business stakeholder to come up with the best case 
design flow. The other one is assemble professional architecture team to get, to get up to a great start of robust infrastructure design and a safe time for solution implementation. So the three key technology building block is related to two critical factors. The critical factor one is building close relationship with R&D that will relate to design flow. And the assemble professional archi architecture team from MediaTek and the AWS will contribute to cloud infrastructure design and a smart batching. All of these two technology, you need AWS help and jointly co-work together to come out a better result. Summary, yeah, after talking about proven result, key consideration for solution implementation and uh, how we make it, let me summarize the key takeaways for today's presentation. First, computing farm management, capacity management has been a critical issue to most of IT over the past year. On one hand, we cannot build the capacity for the peak. On the other hand, it's really difficult to forecast each utilization, especially under a high utilization environment. But by the flexibility and the application of hybrid cloud, it allows us to leverage as many as 12 million core hours with high memory configuration to close the resource gap during our 5G SOC project peak. So without hybrid cloud, we cannot make it. Secondary, regarding hybrid cloud adoption, you need to assess your EDA workloads. For our case, we assess our EDA workload out of more than 30 design flow and come out which one we want to apply. apply. So that means you need to assess your you need to assess your workload pattern and then come out what is the most impact. Thirty, oh sorry. Thirty, when implementing a hybrid cloud solution, the cloud infrastructure and the technology is different what we have done at in-house environment. In terms, especially in terms of batching system, data transfer, instance sizing and uh, storage capacity. Not only do we need to understand the technical requirements to address key consideration, but also we should have an architect team from AWS and MediaTek based on our implementation experience. This is really a critical part for your hybrid cloud solution implementation. Fourthly, regarding cost, it always matters. So pick up a suitable pricing model for its implementation. Finally, in addition to an architecture team from both parties, assess a successful hybrid cloud execution still requires seamless collaboration between you and uh, your service, cloud service provider. For example, we form a 24 by seven project warrant to mitigate our, in case we have an emergency. 
So I hope our case sharing will inspire more and more enterprise to realize EDA workloads in the cloud. If you need to cope with the problem of peak capacity management. So be prepared, get ready, refer to our two critical success factors, three key technology building blocks, and four key consideration for your solution implementation. Based on that, your journey of EDA workload on the cloud will be smooth sailing. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, YC and, and Vicky. It's truly inspiring uh, story there. Tape out critical workloads, final verification of a massive 5G uh, SOC. It's just a great story. Um, we have other sessions uh, at reInvent I wanted to, uh, to call out, breakout sessions that we have. On Wednesday, we have a, uh, a, a MFT 405 <coughs> launching a turnkey scale-out compute environment in minutes on AWS. So that's a, that's a great session to understand how to actually build these environments. Yes, Mark? Oh, that has moved. This is, uh, this is out of date. Thank you so much. So check your session catalogs. Thank you, Mark, for calling that out. That has actually moved, so check your catalogs for that new session time. Uh, SageMaker to improve semiconductor yields. Again, check your catalog to make sure these times are accurate. That session is on the smart manufacturing side of it, so using machine learning for silicon wafer defect analysis. It's a really interesting talk. Uh, Tower Jazz, uh, Gilad will be uh, presenting that talk. And then uh, MFG 403, that's another ARM presentation, uh, talking about how to use uh, analytics, telemetry, uh, with our partner Alexis, and how to instrument these flows to, to optimize performance and do a, a, a more smooth uh, migration to cloud. And then on Thursday, still on Thursday, the workshop. Thank you, Mark. So electronic design automation, the scaling EDA workflows, that's a, that's a workshop. And the, that's not the workshop. Okay, my apologies. Check your catalogs for these sessions. They're, uh, they're quite important. The numbers are right. My descriptions are wrong. But check your catalog uh, for these workshops uh, on semiconductor and EDA related topics. We're really happy that uh, you were here today and that we had the opportunity to tell these stories. We'll be here for another uh, 10 to 15 minutes to answer any questions you have. Uh, please feel free to come up. Thank you so much for your time today.